Hello and welcome to the Goon Talk. Back again with you guys for another show, for another episode of our Let's Talk Arsenal series, our twice weekly show on a Tuesday and a Friday. And we're doing our Tuesday show today in which I am joined by a guest who I'll introduce you in just a second. But we're going to be talking about how kind of where we see Arsenal. We're in the international break. We've got to fill it with some stuff to talk about. And as we enter kind of the latter stages of the season with Arsenal still far off their main target, but with the potential to achieve their ultimate target of getting into top four through the Europa League. Debating about where I suppose we need to put all of our resources. Do we need to split our resources? How do we tackle the last few games of the season? So if you've got questions, make sure you put them in the chat box. But other than that, it's been a pleasure, as always, to bring you the show. So let's crack on with it. I'm joined today by Johnny Cochran from U to B. How you doing, mate? Are you well? I'm very well, very well, yeah. Um, feeling optimistic. The sun shines more these days. Look, that, mm. that bit there, that is the sun coming <laughs> through the window, kissing the great man. Where's he gone? Up there, you know what I mean? So sooner rather than later, the sun will be sneaking onto Thierry's shorts and then we can really, really start to feel like we're rocking. You know, it is nice knowing that. I mean, I used to do these five o'clock shows in complete darkness, so it is nice. Um, that <laughs> candle they light. To be light, yeah, it is nice, it is for sure. Um, you mentioned a great there in Thierry Henry, and our sponsors this week, Football Prizes, have got another one of our striking greats as their prize this week because they've got a signed Ian Wright, uh, Bruce Banana shirt uh, available this week, and it's framed. It's even got, as far as I'm aware, built-in LED lights to really show off your signed shirt as well. Um, I think there's only just, there's less, I think, now than 40 tickets remaining. Yeah, there is indeed. So you've got until Friday to get your tickets in for this one. And members, of course, expert members and TGT ambassadors, you can get your free entry, possibly, uh, if you go into the Discord server and you win the free entry on Friday's show. So make sure you tune in for that. But welcome to everyone in the chat box today. And make sure you get your thoughts on how kind of where you see us between now and the end of the season. So, I mean, it's an easy one to start off with, Johnny, but we're sitting in ninth in the league. We're in the quarterfinals of the Europa League with 10, nine, 10 games left of the season. If you're thinking about that, where we are right now, it isn't like in, it's not been successful to this point, really, besides our progression in the Europa League so far. No, no, no. It's, it's been an absolute disaster and uh it's been a disaster of a season sorry you just froze for a second there it might have been my internet click, but you were just like that and i was like oh. has he got something else to say <laughs> uh, but no um so yeah look it's it's been a disaster of a season that I, and i don't think that that should be lost it, it's so interesting that um we're talking about this and i said to you just before we jumped on there that i think it's a really good time to have a show like this because it does feel like a lot of the Arsenal fans are at a point of contemplation where they genuinely look back and they don't really necessarily know how to feel. And there's a real split with regards to how we judge what we're seeing at the moment with, with Arsenal. And a friend of mine, a long time, an, an old friend, uh, called me up today and we were talking about it. Shout out to Liat. Um, he's not old. He is actually a young man, but uh, he's an old friend as in we've been friends for a long time. Sure. Um, and, you know, he is firmly in the um, kind of camp where he is, let's say, unconvinced by the Arteta project. And um, he, he, you know, we have similar look, views on a, a few different aspects. And, and, and the way I would say uh, surmise, if you like, where we're at is I look at the situation and I say he couldn't have got off to a better start, Arteta. You know, he won a cup when he had zero expectations on him because of the mess that we were left in under Unai Emery. But, I, you know, as has been brought up to me recently, um, when we say about giving a new manager a chance, like, you know, what does a chance look like if after six months of results not going our way, people are starting to get on his back a little bit, you know, mm. and, and is that appropriate? But for me... You also have to contextualise it in the sense that we've had the worst start to a season in 50 years. And in any other year, that gets you sacked. It just does. Like, I mean, And it should. It should get you sacked. But mm. obviously, the FA Cup, let's say that that FA Cup bought him a little extra time. But what we're all sitting here waiting for is shoots of life, shoots reasons to be optimistic that next year won't be the same. But for me, where I feel that we are is that I need to see 
I want us to win. Everyone does. But I really feel that we need to win the Europa League. And I think that particularly with the way the draw's gone, it couldn't be have worked better for us. The draw yeah. is an absolute cakewalk into the final. And, you know, it would have been different if we had, say, drew United in this round. And we played United in a tough game. And Fernandez, who is a world-class talent, or Pogba has, a you know, one of those games where they just score a hat-trick or something. We just couldn't get through. We've got Slavia Prague, who I don't care what year it is, Arsenal should be beating Slavia Prague. It's just got added animosity built in because they've got loads of racism flying around the club as well. So we've got to do those absolute mugs, knock them out <laughs> once and for yeah. all. Yeah. Um, and then when you're talking about Unai Emery with Villarreal, that you can't you can't go down to Unai Emery and Villa. They might not get through, but they probably will. Villarreal, you can't. So realistically, we've got to get through to the final because. If we don't, it will be another adding. It will be more adding insult to injury with the way the Europa plays out. If we don't get through to the final now, and off the back of the worst start in fifty years, I don't think you can simply look at the last three months as, with a slight upturn in form and spin that well. So you know, and, and I want to be clear on one more thing before I just uh, go back to you. When I say about you know the attitudes towards our, our you know Arteta leaving. Um, you know, coming in. I don't actually think he's going to go. I don't think mm. the club have thought that far ahead to think <laughs> about replay. I don't think that they're there. And I also think that when the club or if the club uh, do need to replace him, they will do it, you know, through gritted teeth because it reflects very, very poorly on the club's leadership. If they've handed the guy a long contract in the summer, they gave him the job in the first place, a novice manager, and they have to replace him. Someone higher than Arteta is going to have to go with him because realistically, can we trust them to get a new manager? You know, when they've made bad decisions. So they, I don't, I don't think he's going anytime soon. But I think that um, realistically, for us as fans and how we judge and appraise this season and Arteta's stewardship, if we don't win the Europa League or have a, you know, gunfight in the Europa League final against a tough opponent, the reality is, I think. The, the fans' mentality should change to the fact mm. that we should be looking at uh, replacing the coach. So, categorically, if we were to not win the Europa League, not getting into European qualification this season, that's for you, it's, that's it? I think what happens then is we start next season with a... Because I don't, again, I don't think... I would say at that point, for me, I would be happy to see him go and get replaced. If that, yeah, if yeah. that plays out that way, I really would. I don't think he will. But what you're going to say then is... A few bad games next year, and he and I will absolutely be calling for his head by Christmas, as I think most people <laughs> will and should be. So, yeah. you know, and, and I don't necessarily want to get into this stage where we're constantly replacing, but the, I, I also get, on from the other side, there just seems to be blind faith at the moment. And I'm just trying to judge what is actually grounded in when, um, when appraising Arteta and, and the project, because... There are undoubtedly things to be optimistic about. I'm not trying to say this is an absolute shit show. It's not, you know. Mm. Um, but there are still, you know, uh, recurring issues which don't seem to get addressed. And there are still issues with certain players who I believe will be instrumental to Arsenal's next five years, a.k.a. Martinelli, who just can't seem to get a break in this team. And that is becoming a bigger issue when you're not a side that is winning. Because the reality is, is if we were winning everything, winning the league, no one would care. But right now, it seems like there's a glaring issue and there's a real, real realistic solution that just doesn't seem to be getting applied. So that is, that's how I see it anyway. Mm. And even whether you agree with me or not, I've been consistent, <laughs> you know, and, and that, that, that yeah. is my criteria. No, and that's, and that's fair. Let me pitch to you kind of, the way I see it um, and how, because I think that it goes beyond, I, ca I can't in my mind turn around and say at the end of this, this year and say that for me, there is evidence enough that the project, the process, whatever anyone wants to call it is, is not working right now. I don't think there's enough for me personally to make that decision. That's based upon the season being basically split into two halves where the first half of the season was utterly dreadful and I think that was through a lack of preparation, a lack of there being pre-season. His first summer window to bring his own players in, he doesn't get a pre-season because of the, the lockdown either. 
Um, we didn't have a natural number 10. We had the chaos of the Urzel situation. We bring in Thomas Partey a few games into the season and then he's all basically almost immediately injured and we lose our, our best midfielder and that means we haven't upgraded upon our midfield and we lose eight games before Boxing Day in the league, which is horrific. And me and you sat here with other guests and we were saying, if this goes, if we lose against Burnley, and we did, <laughs> we might have to turn around and say, yeah, it's probably the end of this. And probably Because it's, it's a case for me of, like, whilst I, I, I could see progression, the cutoff point is if Arsenal is sitting in the relegation zone, you can't really defend that. Um, and that was kind of the cutoff for me during the season, no matter how much I wanted to back this guy. If we'd have been dropping into the relegation zone, I would have been like, yeah, it's, da it's damage control now and you have to change it because it's getting worse before it gets better might get us relegated <laughs> at this point. But it didn't. The point was is that actually when it came to Boxing Day, Arteta got his natural number 10 in. He got Emil Smith-Rowe, who'd been playing the under-23s from an injury that kept him out at the start of the season, building up his match fitness, match sharpness, played in the Europa League, proved himself, and Arteta rewarded him with a start against Chelsea. And that changed things for us. And since Boxing Day, we've, of course, we've lost three games in the league, being Man City, where they barely had to get out of second gear, and it was one of the worst <laughs> games I've ever had to see Arsenal play. Uh, they just basically just bent over to Man City that entire game. And then you've got Wolves and Aston Villa. And, and the, those two games to me, like the Wolves game, I think will go down as the worst thing that could have happened to Arsenal this season, unless we get knocked out by Slavia Prague in the next round of the Europa League. <laughs> but losing to Wolves to me is the worst thing about this season, because had we have won that game, we would have been sitting in sixth and we would have been in a really good place going into the next game, which was Aston Villa on the top of a high focused, ready, having the momentum, but we make a mistake in the Aston Villa game in the first five minutes, go 1-0 down, we lose 1-0, and also we had like a, a penalty that didn't go our way, an arguable red card not given. And those things, I think, those little kind of microcosms in the season have a big impact on the larger context of the season. I, I look at the end of the season, I go, if we don't win the Europa League, uh, it, it has to be in a sense of the we lose to United in the final. That's the only justifiable way I can see the Europa League unless something horrific happens and we are utterly like shafted through officials or something and it's ridiculous. But the only way that's legitimately we can now come out of this Europa League and it be justified is if we lose to Manchester United and lose to a side that play us off the park on that day. If, if we go into that United game and we look the better team or if we just basically get walked over and we didn't even try, then there's uh, another argument to be had. Yeah. Because the league is is tricky. We're going to, obviously the whole point of the show is to talk about the running and where we see things. The league is really weird because there are so many teams above us, but still within touching distance of us, with nine games left to go and twenty seven points left to play of our season. And one of those is weirdly Liverpool. Of course, we play. And if we beat, if we win against Liverpool, that's going to really open up more interesting thoughts and avenues and debates to be had. But I disagree in the sense that I wouldn't sack him at the end of this season because from the recruitment that we've done under him, the changes that we've made, the improvements that have happened, I think have been kind of undermined by a lot of things that some people will call excuses, which is fair enough. But I look at them as genuine mitigating circumstances to this season. Yeah, I mean, um, let me just get this forward so people can see me a little bit better. <laughs> there you go. Oh, glowing. Now, um... Shout out to everyone in the chat as well. Even though a lot of people in the chat disagree with me, I like reading it. No. Uh, and, you know, particularly <laughs> the people. Uh, keep it, keep it, um, don't resort to, uh, like, personal digs anyway, which is good. But, I like, I like, you know, people are there and they're saying, you know, that first of all, there was someone I saw say that I've always been Arteta out. I just want to clear that out. I absolutely <laughs> haven't. I, I started this season, I was like, he's the man. Go. He's absolutely that. sick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to, to me, that is just absolutely not true. I was so gassed on Arteta. But for me, for me to claw back the feelings for uh, of goodwill for him through that dreadful run, I also, it's like in relationships, once I've been fooled once, I don't want to give away my heart that quickly again. Like prove that it's different. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I'm a, I'm a, a slower prize to win back. I'd say on that front. And I, I, I appreciate that people are saying, look, we're talking about the running, and yet we've gone to the Arteta in out debate. It's not really about these things. Are not you know mm. you can't look at these things in isolation. They're all connected. So what when we talk about the running, we're talking about what are our hopes for the um, the end of the season. Europa League. It's that simple. Yeah. We have to win the Europa League. And if we don't win the Europa League, then what I'm saying is there's a, the obvious questions 
that start coming out of it. And that is to do with whether we have the correct leadership in place. So I'm not trying to drag it down the same things or it's just not about that. It's that we have to look at the, you know, the, the whole situation with regards to Arsenal and the direction the club's moving in. Because realistically, when you look at the league, it none of it matters anymore. The, the actual league makes no difference. It doesn't, we ain't going down. We ain't getting top four. We ain't getting Europe. We are nowhere near consistent enough to string results together in the league. We just look like we absolutely have you know, some top performances in us, but we also have absolute Rohan Ricketts in us all the time as well. So we, um, you know, we, we can't, we can't honestly plan for, you know, a, a sustained push on maybe sixth or seventh place to try and sneak into Europa that way, because I just mm-hmm. don't see us as being consistent enough. And we haven't, we're running out of time in that matter. We've got nine games left. It's not, we don't have that, um, that gap for the mistakes that we have in our, you know, that margin of error, I should say. So, you know, shout out to everyone who's saying it. It's just the, the fact is, is that I'm, I, I think that these things are, cannot be viewed in isolation. They all link together. So when we talk about what our ultimate desires and hopes are for this season, it is the Europa League. And with regards to the league, I'd like to see these people as well who are saying Martinelli's not the answer and stuff. First of all, I don't know how you can say that. He's not been given a chance since he's been back. Mm -hmm. And yet Arteta has come out and said that ultimately he's training exceptionally. He's doing everything he can to get the place. He absolutely needs to be started. And there's no justification for him not getting game time now because ultimately we've got another striker who, granted, is the club captain, but is stinking the place out right now who is very much due a dropping, you know, yeah. and if, if Martinelli can't get in over him, the, the reason why I bring this up is because the league campaign should be used for nothing more than priming us for you, the big Europa League games and blooding youngsters to see whether they're good enough or not. Otherwise, mm. it doesn't make any difference whether we lose or win. The league is a wash and that's due to how we started this league campaign, not how we finished it. No, I, that that's what makes it always it's really tricky for someone like myself who wants to try and defend the situation is that the, the start of the season it's unchangeable it's there it's done it's happened and, and there's nothing that I can say or do that changes that I think there are reasons why the season went so poorly at the start and we've kind of touched on that already but the Martinelli thing's interesting because I I agree I have kind of like a split view on this in the sense that I agree with you right now in this moment based on the Bamiyang's form based on the fact that Willian's not getting in the squad. Martinelli deserves to be given more chances. There is, for me, prior to that, when he was kind of coming back from his injury in the the, the, the January to start of March period, William was playing quite well, uh, ironically, did really well against Leicester, did really well in the Europa League against Olympiacos, um, did well also in the, the home game. I can't remember who we played against. It was the, the game after that he came in as well, did quite well. And and Pepe was there, and Smith Rowe and Erdogan were playing together, which made it even diff- trickier for Martinelli to get in the team. Now, though, with a Bamiang Simi, if he wants to play a Bamiang and he wants to play one of Smith Rowe and, and Erdogan, which we saw, of course, against West Ham, then I think Martinelli's got a really good shout to be on that left hand side. Or even if Lacazette isn't going to be as clinical as is he, he hasn't been massively clinical. He's needed a bit, few things to go his way, it's fair to say, to get his goals to go in then there's a chance for him to say maybe blood him as a bit of a striker, give him an opportunity, give him a last 20 minutes in games as a centre forward if we're in a certain position where we can afford to do that. I really thought he could start the game against Olympiacos at home and he and he didn't. And I thought that was a really big missed opportunity considering that Olympiacos needed three goals to go through. So I couldn't, I couldn't understand why Martinelli wasn't given a, a start in charge in that game whatsoever. And he came on for like 10 minutes at the end. And I'm like, what? what's the point? Like, even I, as the biggest defender of Arteta, turn around thinking, I think you've got it wrong. And I thought he got the, the team selection wrong against West Ham as well. And that's why I thought we started so poorly too. But one of the fun things we get to do when talking about the running, and we are going to do it on the show, is obviously we go for each fixture and say win, draw or loss. And we add up on how many points we think we're going to get. We'll get that done about halfway through the show. But just before we get to that, of course, what's really weird about the Europa League games is that there's the sandwich between some really weird fixtures for us. Because there's the, if we get through, say, against Slavia Prague, which, by the way, the games against Slavia Prague come after Liverpool, and then it's in between Sheffield United and Fulham. 
So you think they're really good opportunities for Arsenal to rotate or if they want to rotate or build up momentum with the starting squad that you want to use in those games. But then the one after that in the semi-final, should we get through, is then after Everton, sandwiched between Newcastle and then a game against West Brom, which is really weird as well. I mean, Newcastle and West Brom, obviously, down there, same as kind of Fulham and Sheffield United. But you look at that towards the end of the season where those relegations threatened teams are going to be really scrapping for all the possible points feasible. We saw it a few years back, I remember, against Sunderland where we lost and Sunderland stayed up because they they beat us at the Emirates. And, and that's that period of games where they really start to get scrapping. And it could be a little bit abrasive during those games. But do you think that there's now scope for Arteta to... You said about blood and the youngsters in the league. So I guess my question is, are you completely done with that side of things? The league is like... Not even worried about getting the wins in them necessarily, but it's all about trying to prepare yourselves each week for the next Europa League fixture. 100%. There, there is nothing else to this. The fact is, is I couldn't give a monkeys about this league now. Not, be, not at the start of the season, I don't I say, oh, we don't care about the league. The mm. way the league has progressed, we've been left with nothing. So why are we still going to be like sweating over it? I don't want to see key players playing in crunch games. I don't want to see um, any risk to injury. I want to be see uh, people getting wrapped in cotton wool, only being used to get their generate form. I want to see players who, you know, are going to be sitting on the bench who may come on. We might need something for them. Getting game time in the league, getting their confidence up. There's no excuse for it. It doesn't matter where we finish in the league now. It really doesn't. It makes no difference in terms of we're not going to get into a position in the league. I, I am absolutely convinced we're not going to get into a position in the league that would warrant the extended effort and um, mm. any kind of risk that would jeopardise that position in Europa. Because... Let's be clear, there can be no excuses for failure in the Europa League. And when I talk about Arteta as well, in terms of, you know, uh, how I see him and the perceived pressure that should be on him, I want him to succeed, obviously. I want to. I want us to do well. So clearing, clearing the decks and saying, you've got no more distractions. All you have to do is focus on beating Slavia Prague Villarreal over over two legs. You know you could get around probably a bad game. There's no ex there's nowhere to hide anymore. There is nowhere to hide. It, realistically, it's final or bust. And I want once you get into the final, I think Arteta has the opportunity to elevate himself into a very high stratosphere as a, a, with regards to a, an Arsenal coach and be the answer to what a lot of our prayers were. And initially under, you know, in that Wenger era, towards the end, I mean, you know, where we were getting so close and constantly bottling it, which we were. It was a bottle job session. So mm. Arteta has the opportunity to change the narrative um, and genuinely flip it so that even if we're not playing well, we're a team that in cup competitions can get the job done and no matter what way we make it look, we'll get the trophy and some. I would be 100% bought into a coach like that. I don't care how we look in the season. How what If we win trophies, you're a winner, mate. That's all I'm caring about, you know. And, you know, I, I just am seeing now Vinny, who is also um, in, in the chat. He's also talked about me potentially donating some of my hair to him. First of all, I've got to rule that out. Uh, comprehensively, <laughs> Vinny, you ain't getting that. But he's also said about it's important to finish above Spurs. Let me be clear. You know, and I do appreciate your point here, Vinny. I do get it, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if oh. if you're talking about if you're talking about whether we win the Europa League or not. I don't care whether I finish above Spurs. We would get into the Champions League. We'd have European success since the first time since '94. You know, it doesn't matter about Saint Totteringham's Day. Reality is, is I think it's more of a sign of how far we've fallen. If that is the you know, benchmark for our success with regards to, um, you know, the league campaign, if it's at the cost of jeopardising real success, which is what we've all, we've got to be in it for, guys, you know, winning cups. Because if we do, if we do, do win that, think, you're able to... Do you not think, though, sorry, that there's like, by winning the games in the league, that that inherently builds up the momentum to go into... If you go into every single Europa League game off the back of a league loss, confidence is so low. Do you not think that's, that would really kind of hit them? And also the fact that we're six points currently off sixth 
That's that's not an, and and we play a team above it. We play several teams above us. Is that is is it? I I struggle to find that there's no way that Arsenal couldn't claw back some points for the last nine games with 27 points still to play for. Well, you know what I'm saying is this, right? Look at the end of Unai Emery's tenure. We had a run in and we were in fourth position with about four games to go, I believe. A couple of those games were dollies. They were set up Crystal Palace and Brighton away, I believe. Yeah. And Unai Emery, um, with hey, one one? with one ret- return, oh yeah, both with mm-hmm. one return leg um, against Valencia uh, to play, he jeopardised the league um, position when we really had a straightforward uh, 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 path into top four and. You know, you can talk about kind of hindsight 2020, but we know that was the case now. If we had won those games, we would have ended up top four. He jeopardised that path to go into the Europa League and ultimately he didn't win it. Well, we shot him down and ultimately his his Arsenal career came to an end due to that decision. Well, I don't mind someone making... I, I said at the time, I had no problem with him making that call and saying, Europa League's my focus. This is what we want to do. We need to win the trophy but you have to win it. And for me, if Arteta literally says, I'm not playing, you know, 90% of my starting lineup um, in the Premier League games, the game before he opened it, I wouldn't care. I wouldn't care if we then lose those games. I don't, I don't necessarily think everyone has to be playing every game to keep momentum up, to keep that form up. Sometimes having a you know, a few days before your next European fit. You remember we're playing on Thursday night, some getting Sunday, Thursday. Sometimes you don't need to play every game in that. But what we have to do is start those Europa League games like we are hell-bent on doing mm. the, these teams in that game. You know, no mistakes because we are playing for the highest stakes in those games. And quite frankly, whether or not we, you know, beat West Brom or... or, or you know, get a good result against Fulham. It doesn't even make any difference to us. But what will be remembered in 20 years, in 30 years, what are you telling your kids about is, we won the Europa League. He done it. Two trophies in a, in, in a year. That's the stuff when I'm like, I'm sold. You're my man. Let's keep going. But if we bottle it and if we play, you know, big players and they do get injured away at Fulham in what is essentially a, a meaningless game, then I don't think you can justify decisions like that. So that's my take on that's my take mm. on where we're at with it. Let's let's do the uh, <laughs> the, the, the run in then. And it's interesting now, considering how little emphasis is on the league for yourself. Um, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, so let me just write this down. So we've got Arsenal against Liverpool um, when we come back off the international break. So Liverpool at home. What do you think it's going to be? Well, <clears throat> typically in yesteryear, I would say, you know, the last few years, we're going to get trounced and we take, you know, we take our stripes and we just get out of there with, you know, anything other than a completely humbling defeat. Mm. However, I've watched Liverpool this year. <laughs> and they ain't great, you know, and they remind me a lot of Arsenal, actually. And the thing, the way they started the season was that with their appalling injuries at the back, like really bad, shocking. You know, not only is there, you you could argue their best player out now because of how instrumental Van Dyke's been. You know, Joe Gomez out for the season as well. And you you started the season where they still had all their attacking uh, power and flair, but they were just vulnerable defensively. But it also shows you how fragile a team can be when they, when you lose linchpins of the unit. And that defensive fragility has bled into their attack, the way that they're actually attacking now as well. Mo Salah looks out of sorts. Mane's not really scoring goals. And I know this because I have them in my fantasy league teams and they've been very disappointed. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think that um, they won't relish coming to Arsenal for once because... I think that their confidence is probably more fragile than ours all of a sudden. And I think that what you do get with um, Liverpool is they will consistently try to play the same way. That that high press will be there. I think we can help ourselves by not doing anything too stupid. Obviously, we do play out from the keeper. But literally, you know, I don't know if they need to put post-it notes all around, you know, 
uh, Leno's like flat or, or or house wherever he lives, just you know, kick it long if needed. Just put that everywhere so he can see it. So you know, we shouldn't be a slave to trying to play it out. But I think that there's no questions that our attacking unit will look at their defence with real vigour and think we can really get at them, really hurt them, uh, because I, I don't even know who's playing at centre-half for them anymore, whether it's still Jordan Henderson. Oh, that, you know, that geezer, who's he? You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> like, come on. So I think that there is the p- uh, potential for joy there and I think that is going to be a, a high-scoring affair, minimum of 2-2, I would say. Um, at, so but win, draw, I'll, loss. I'll go for I'll go for the two two draw, but I wouldn't be surprised if we beat Liverpool either. Okay, so Can I do point? that half That's, sitting on the fence? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to put you down for one point. Um, I think we're going to win it um, because I am an optimist, and there's absolutely no tactical explanation behind that whatsoever. <laughs> That's we, it. We just, might. We might. I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't. I don't feel that strongly that we won't beat them. Put it that way. I think we yeah. could beat them. I don't. I don't. I hope we don't lose. I hope we don't. But I. I think. A draw or pushing into a win would be my uh, kind of gut feeling. Sheffield United away. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're just doing win. This is a guaranteed banker win. Um, <laughs> again, but, you know, the fact is, is that if we're plotting this out with regards to whether we should win or not win, of course, it's a banker win. But we'd be remiss if we didn't look at the two fixtures. Sam, It's sandwiched between... Yeah. And for me, um, I, I think that will be a win anyway because they are in between Awful. managers and an absolutely shocking outfit. So, you know, again, if 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 you haven't played Martinelli at Prague, has to start games like this, has to, to be set, a, set a, amongst a defence that, you know, looks championship level at best. Um, mm. Really, their bubble has burst from last season. So, you know, I expect to win and win comfortably in that game, even with our B team. So uh, that is the kind of game where I expect our, you know, not necessarily reserves, but our squad players to get some serious game time and uh, and get some confidence up with it. Yeah, it's, they've lost 23 games this season. Uh, they've taken points in six matches all season. If Arsenal don't get a win in that game, it is going to be horrifically worrying um, if they don't. Um, Fulham at home. It's got to be a win again, but, um, you know, it, it it will matter how the Slavia Prague game's gone. Um, if we get knocked obviously, out, I can see us losing that. <laughs> what I mean, you know, or, or no, to be honest, it's the kind of game where we did get knocked out, we would probably win that and then you know, be made, made to feel like that's a positive sign when it's obviously not. See, because mm. this is the kind of thing where I don't, I couldn't give a monkey's whether we beat Fulham or not if we've got through that Slavia Prague game. We've just got to get the big games done. But I do think from what I've seen of Fulham, they're quite a resilient outfit. Um, Scott Parker's got them playing well. They they rarely get trounced. You know, they've been bested on a few occasions this year. But in most games, certainly... You know, when we talk about Arsenal form picking up since the turn of the year, Fulham has as well, and they're much more resilient. They've got some big scouts on their resume this year, and I kind of have a bit of a feeling they're going to get themselves safe as well and um, stay up this yeah. year. Our because drop. yeah, yeah, because I do, I do think that one, I don't think they're defensively as fragile as they have been at times. Or they can have an odd bad game, but they're pretty. They've got much more defensively solid, and. Whilst they've got um, inefficient attacking players and they do need seem to need quite a lot of chances to finish their dinner, they still have that threat and they've got a pacey unit. When you look at Sheffield United, it's so static and outside of, you know, one of their defenders scoring a header, you don't even know how they're going to score goals. So Mm. Fulham, for me, will pose a threat. But if we're at home, we should be doing them even with our squad players playing. Then a week later is a, the intriguing Arteta Ancelotti battle um, against Everton, which comes right before if Arsenal do manage to get past Slavia Prague before the the Europa League game, which yeah. I feel will have a big impact on the squad uh, if we manage to go through. So I, I think we're going to draw that one, um, probably. What do you think? 
I'm I'm on a draw draw to loss basically. Like if if Liverpool was a draw to win, this is a draw to loss. Um, if we did, bearing in mind that as you say, if we do rest players, I think you know a few squad players in, we get beat by Everton. And if you're gonna kind of, you know, again, this I don't want I want to keep hammering on the point. I don't care. Like if you're telling me we're in a the semi final, then we're still on track for what we need. So I don't really care if Everton come and beat us at our ground. It's not going to make any difference to the grand scheme of things. So let's put me down for a draw, but I think they, you know, especially if they are pushing on and can, you know, can really get something in the league, they probably would be able to do us just on, you know, that kind of determination in order to get something. They're playing for something as opposed to us anyway. Uh, Newcastle away are in between the two semi-final matches. Um, do you know what Newcastle were are, are really poor, aren't they? And and, <laughs> and and the fact is, is that they won't have Joe Willock either. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The best player, quite frankly, at the moment. Yeah. Um, so you know, I I just kind of the way I see football is when you hire Steve Bruce. <laughs> you might be able to avoid it for a while, but your luck will catch up with you in the end. He is a championship manager, not <laughs> not like the computer game, but kind of like that because he probably gets sacked on there a lot as well. He yeah. ultimately is not, um, you know, if you have players who are like yo-yo players, yo-yo play for yo-yo clubs, they bounce in and out of the league, never really kind of too good for the championship, too bad for the premiership. There are yo-yo managers as well. And Steve Bruce is absolutely in that gang. Mm. Um, I don't think he has particularly progressive ideas of how to move a football club forward, but ultimately is an easy hire for a disillusioned and quite frankly, you know, um, vacant owner in Mike Ashley at um, Newcastle. So for me, I... You hinted at it already, but I think that Newcastle could start getting really sucked into the um, rally zone. And therefore, even, despite our distractions, we should have too much for Newcastle, um, you know, and we'll probably win one, two, one or two nil up, up there, I reckon. Yeah, it is frustrating that the game before the semi-final is the, the longest trip we have to make in England. <laughs> um, but that is ironic that it falls on that day. We are at home, so at least we're not double travelling uh, for the first leg. Should, of course, we get through. Um, Ray Anderson in the chat uh, says, aren't we at home to Everton, though, in regards to kind of predicting that game? What I'll say is that I, I don't, I really, it's, there's nowhere near as much kind of boost or a lack of boost from being home and away this season it, it doesn't make too much of a difference as I think we've seen from Arsenal's home form this year um after that and after the uh second second leg of the semi-final I believe um we've got West Brom um which <laughs> we obviously battered when we went to, uh we went to the baggies ground um but again they could be they could even be relegated by that point so that yeah. would be a really weird one um because i think there's only four games left or uh, yeah there's only one two so that's the fourth game before the end so realistically when you're thinking about the fact that they're already i mean they're 10 points off safety now with four games left it's very likely they could already be relegated by that point too um yeah. so you'd expect us to win that game yeah, that's a win. Uh, straightforward. I've seen nothing from them all year. They're, they've got one player. Uh, oh, what's his name now? Um, Pereira? Uh, yeah, uh, Pereira. The only player I've seen who has any real quality. And I'm going to say Ainsley Maitland-Niles. I'm going to say he's not actually their player. Uh, and for instance, he is a guy who I look at and think, maybe he could do a job at Arsenal, uh, mm. Ainsley Maitland-Niles. But um, yeah, apart from that, they... I've never really looked like they're um, good enough for this league, and they'll go down and good riddance, come back with a better unit because that it's been it's just not been good enough. So yeah, definitely getting a win there. And the toughest game of the arguably the toughest game of the running beyond maybe Liverpool um, is is Chelsea away, at which we haven't been too bad going to Chelsea of late. Um, of course, we got a good draw against them last season with the Martinelli goal and the Bellerin goal. Um, so what do you think there? I mean, Tuchel, obviously, we haven't played him yet this season. We beat them at home under Frank Lampard. He has really yeah. kind of turned their fortunes. Are you expecting a, a Chelsea win in this one? Yeah, that'd be a loss for us. Um, I don't really see any other way that it's going to pan out. Um, 
you know, sometimes you have uh, managers, similar to players as well, where they have good teams that they like to play against. And I think that Arteta loved going up against Chelsea under Lampard. He seemed to have his number. Uh, very rarely did we look threatened in games against Lampard. And I think that he was getting out tactic a lot of the times uh, when we were having heads-to-heads with Chelsea. Uh, and obviously, he got the better of him overall. But um, mm. I think... I think Tuchel is much more of a thinking man's uh, manager. He's a, a tactician. Um, and they have looked far more resilient than um, what they did under Lampard. And uh, I think with our distractions, and I'm I'm kind of basing this on, this on the fact that I think we will be in the Europa League semis at that point. Like We would have been there. Um, and I think we would have had some big games that would have meant something. So when we're heading into games at this stage, legs a little bit weary and potentially distracted either way that the semis have gone. Um, I think, uh, I think they, they will have too much for us with regards to the fact that they'll be still pushing in the league as well. So yeah, I expect a loss at that point. Uh, then our least favorite game of the entire season, uh, Crystal Palace away, <laughs> which is just always such a horrible, horrible game to do. Um, but what do you feel about that one? Do you know what the thing the thing about Palace away is? It's a, it's a, it's a difficult game at the best of times. You know what yeah. I mean? It's 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 a game where Palace have made their name of being not only kind of there are teams like the likes of Stoke and uh, you know Burnley who are just like durable teams who are going to get match you fifty fifty and hit them hard, you know, and win headers and that. But they've really got very little class on the ball. Um, Crystal Palace have a little bit of that in terms of they've got a lot of players who are, you know, solid Premier League players who certainly like the physicality of the league. But they've also got that bit of bit of flair, that bit of um, uh, genius that can unlock even the best teams. I remember even those Man City teams that looked invincible and... Palace went up there, Andros Townsend scoring screamers, and you're thinking a team that looked unbeatable when Palace find the way because they marry that resilience with actual bits of genius. So the Palace away is always a tough game, and I think whatever way it goes will probably uh, be a very, very tricky game for us and, and would be a draw at best, but I'd probably say we'll lose that game. Yeah, I put I put it down as a win because <laughs> I'm the optimist. Um, but we'll put you down as a loss for that one. Um, Brighton at home on the last game. That's, we do quite well usually on the last game of the season. It's something that whether or not we've got anything to play for, usually you have us down for a win. But it is Brighton who have got a very good record against that. That win we got uh, at the Amex was like our first in six attempts of playing Brighton. So how do you think this game's going to go? They could still be in a relegation fight at this point, but who knows? They could be hundred percent. But I think my train of thought would go to your initial statement about we always end the season well, often when we've got nothing to play for, and mm. we the sun's shining at that point. And Arsenal love playing well when the sun's shining and they can get their kids on the pitch afterwards. They won't need to this year. And I want to. Oh yeah, actually, people will be in the stadium by that point. Yeah, um, get the kids on the pitch after. But yeah, no, I expect us to do Brighton on that. Thing. I don't think Brighton will have anything to play for. They should be good and clear. But at that point, we'll probably, you know, f- get deliver a flashy game, win by a few goals. Um, and I'm hoping we still have a final to look forward to. But if not, that will be the selling point for next season. Oh, look how well we've done against Brighton. Um, yeah. Either way. So I do expect us to win that game. So that what that means is basically you based on those results you think we'll end on fifty nine points based on my results we'll finish on sixty four points five points more um, but there's only we won't go into as much anywhere near as much detail in fact all I'm going to ask is while we go through these other teams is just a simple win loss or draw so we're going to start off with the the four other teams that are above us right now. Go through those, then we'll have an idea of what the table could look like. Because it could be funny after you say it about (laughs) (laughs) the league doesn't matter. (laughs) And then um, what we do is is we'll go through this and ends up we're actually with you know we're fifth. So (laughs) we'll see how it goes. And we'll start off with um, Spurs, uh, Mm -hmm. and I'll go through their fixtures. So they've got next Newcastle away. Um, they'll win that. Okay, I think they'll win that as well. Uh, United at home. 
Draw. Okay. Uh, Everton away. Draw. Sheffield United at home. Win. Leeds away. Win. Uh, Wolves at home. Win. Aston Villa at home. Win. And Leicester away. Mm, lose. Last game of the season. Lose. Yeah, I could lose. Um, next one is Everton. So Everton's fixtures are... Uh, Crystal Palace at home. Uh, win. Yeah, I put win. Brighton away. Win. Oh, I, I think they might draw that one. Um, Spurs at home. Oh, I mean, you put for that one. Draw, did I? Draw, put? yeah, you said draw. Yeah, I think, I I think a draw win, sounds yeah. about right. Um, ourselves, us. I think you put draw for us as well. So that I was think that draw. Draw that you thought could be loss. I yeah, think. exactly. Draw could be loss. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm be that's my Arsenal head saying draw, but they they will be coming there thinking they can beat us. Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah of course. Um, just thinking, why did I put that down? Was that the fourth game? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. I did say draw as well. Um, Aston Villa at home for Everton. Um, draw. Uh, West Ham away. Win. They've got a great Sheffield record against Sheffield United at home. I imagine we're both going to put win for that. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Anyone Wolves who's got Sheffield home. United is is just a win. You can just fill that in. <laughs> yeah. Wolves at home. Um, Wolves at home. Put it as a draw, I think. Uh, Man City away on the last day when they could lift the title. Man City, they'll want to mm. win that. Ever and lose. Ever and lose that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we've got two down, two to go. Uh, we've got now Liverpool, who are still involved in Champions League football. Um, so we've got their next game is ourselves. And we said we, you said we'd win that one. Oh, you said we draw. I said draw. Draw. Yeah. That one. I said we'd win that one. So uh, loss. Uh, after Real Madrid, they've got Aston Villa at home. Uh, draw. Um, then after the second leg of Real Madrid, they got Leeds away. Uh, do you know what? I'll go draw again. I think Liverpool are going to have a tough, tough running in this league. Yeah. Newcastle they, they, at home is the next one. I think that's a... Newcastle yeah. at home. Yeah, that's a win. But then they've got United away. Um, loss, loss. Okay. Uh, Southampton at home. Win. West Brom away. Win. Burnley away. Yeah, put them as a win, actually. And Crystal Palace at home on the last game when they won, what was it? 8-0? Was it 8-0? 8-1 <laughs> or something when they played them? Uh, put that down as a draw, though. I don't, uh, you know, okay. fragile. Okay, right. And the last one is West Ham. So West Ham have got Wolves away. Uh, say that again. It, Wolves away. West for, Ham. For, for West Ham. Um mm. Uh, I'll go. I'll go with win for them. Uh, Leicester at home. Um, I think they'll lose. Newcastle away. Win. Chelsea at home. Draw. Burnley away. Uh, win. Uh, Everton at home. A uh, loss. You Everton, yeah, you put an Everton win for that one. So did I. Yeah. Uh, Brighton at home. Sorry, Brighton away. Uh, draw. Uh, West Brom away. Win. And Southampton at home. Win. Okay. So whilst I'm doing the math, which will be fun. Um, <laughs> Just, uh, I'm just going to scroll up for the chat and see if I can get any questions uh, whilst I'm going through the maths for you. So, uh, Reginald Perry says, Mainsley wants to be a midfielder and we want him to be a right back. I mean, what do you kind of look at as 
Mainsley's long-term future at the club? Um, I mean, is that based on the fact of whether he actually has a future at yeah, the club? Yeah, do, do you see him staying? Do you see him going? Um, I don't. I don't think he's got a future at the club, um, and I think that's unfortunate actually because I, I do think he is a. Um, a guy with talent, and I don't think he's someone who is necessarily going to be a player that you build your team around. But when he has stepped up, he, he's performed admirably. And and you can't, for me, have enough of those players who can come in. This guy was getting plugged in at right back, putting in mm. like man of the match performances, full back. I think that he's got more than enough kind of ability to have been given more of a shot in midfield, particularly in the dark days of the you know, Xhaka El Nenny um, axis that we've wheeled out and still seem to wheel out sometimes, yeah, which I... when it's been proven to be an absolute redundant partnership. So for me, if, if, if you're going to ever think about picking them two, I'd rather see Ainsley go in against over one of those players. And at the moment with, you know, Xhaka's, you've got to say return to a bit of form, you'd say putting him in next, next to Xhaka and adding that athleticism and dynamism would probably you know, um, plug some of those um, holes that are left when Xhaka is not playing alongside Thomas Partey uh, and looks to be exposed with anyone who doesn't have those legs to cover for him. So for me, I'd like to see him be given a chance, but I just don't... I think the facts of the matter are is the way that Arteta has managed these players, he has painted himself into a few corners with a few of them and Ultimately, there aren't really going to be ways back for some of these guys. Um, and I think that Ainsley, you know, I, I think it's wrong sometimes to speculate on players' mentalities like, and, you know, whether certain people are troublemakers and that. And I've seen that be banded around with Ainsley. Like he's kind of got a, he's like a, a bit of a confrontational player or a bit of a, um, basically he just rocks the boat a little bit. And I, I don't, I don't know if that's true. I don't necessarily get that from him. You know, I, I understand where people get the sense that he's a little bit um, uh, kind of carefree on the pitch a little mm. bit. He, he's got that kind of languid approach to um, his football the way that Ozil would have. And he looks, you know, you could confuse it with being uninterested. But I think that's also what makes him great because he, he just doesn't get flustered. And if we praise him for being in those big games... Uh, and not losing his head, having that big game temperament like he did in the cup final, that comes from just not taking every game as it comes and just not, you know, um, being too excitable. So, you know, I don't, I think that we need more of those players in the team because we've got a fair few players in our team who are too affected by the moment and the occasion. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to see him stay, but if I'm honest, I think ultimately he's going to be one of the ones that we bundle up and uh, hopefully get a decent return fee for um, from, yeah, some Premier League team. Um, let's scroll down uh, and see if we... Oh, I saw a question about Torreira and Kalasanac's future. I mean, are we both in agreement that Kalasanac probably doesn't have a future uh, beyond this summer? Uh, I'm just going to try and find it. But what about Torreira? Torreira is a really weird one because a lot of... Obviously, he did really well when he came in. And we need another centre midfielder, and he is a competent player, but hasn't really been given a chance under uh, Arteta. So, what do you make of his future? Yeah, well, it's tricky, isn't it? But what what you have to do when you're looking at these guys, particularly Torreira, who's been given no chance under Arteta ultimately. Um, but I, I, you know, some of it you just have to accept what the manager sees, and that's not the kind of player that he wants in his lineup and sees as part of the future. But Torreira's not a guy like... I know there were different reasons for why Guendouzi went out on loan. You know, there were behavioural issues and stuff. But, yeah, it, you know, Torreira's not young in the way that Guendouzi is, where you're like, oh, go out and have a good season and we can bed you back in. He's like, this is the player that you're getting. And so if you're sending him out on loan, ultimately, you're not sending him out on loan so he can get better for a year at Atletico. You're sending him out alone because you don't see him as part of your plan. And I don't really think that anything out of this season would have changed Arteta's mind. So unless there is a change in leadership, I don't really see how uh, Torreira is going to have a future. Uh, granted, 
Arteta has shown this with other players, giving people a way back into the team, you know, to mm. fight for their place. But I don't really see it with Torreira as a long-term solution. And ultimately, we'll be trying to get his price up and recoup the ma- maximum in terms of a transfer fee for him. Uh, I've done the maths and it's very different. <laughs> it's very, very different what we've got. Uh, unsurprisingly, Johnny, in ninth place is Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, in eighth place is Everton. Seventh place, Liverpool. Sixth place, Spurs. And fifth place, West Ham. So West Ham keeping that fifth place spot. Um, but this is where people are going to laugh. Um, for me, in ninth place is Spurs. <laughs> I can already see the bias is coming in here. Uh, Everton eighth, Liverpool seventh, West Ham sixth. And guess what? Arsenal fifth. We've done, We've it. done it, lads. Yeah. <laughs> We've done it. We've, We've made done it. it. Oh, we shouldn't even me. play the rest of the season. Let's go with your... I mean, we don't even need to. It's it's done deal. I mean, just, just to give you an idea of my fixtures, I don't know how I've even done this. Um... I've only got standards losing one game in the league between now and the end of the season, which now I'm looking at and going, well, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Um, I said we beat Liverpool. Yeah, Chelsea, yeah. Beat Liverpool, beat Sheffield United, beat Fulham, uh, draw with Everton, uh, beat Newcastle, beat West Brom, lose to Chelsea, beat Palace, beat Brighton. And the thing is, it's like, Arsenal are where they are this season, not because of losing against big sides, but because they've lost against teams that they should have beaten this season. That's, That's the biggest question. Um, if Arsenal can overcome that in the in the last like part of the season, then there is all the will in the world that what I've said could come true. But it is Arsenal, and I am an optimistic, very optimistic person, admittedly. So uh, I mean, Yo-Yo says, "I wish I saw the world the way that Tom does." Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> I've got tinted glasses on the whole time. Um, but yeah, it's West Ham. People are saying, obviously, they might think you've been a bit optimistic with West Ham, um, but you've got them winning 17 points out of one, two, three, four, five, uh, 17 out of 27. So even the team that you think is going to finish fifth drop 10 points between now and the end. It's going to be really competitive in the last few games because so many yeah. teams are playing each other. And that's yeah. what makes this really, really tricky. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I do think that West Ham are not a um I don't think it's a fad I do think they've been fantastic this year and I do think they'll have enough to maintain they'll certainly get in Europe in my opinion mm. even when they played us like you know we gave we gave them some will work in that second half and that's what Arsenal were capable of and at our best we we could be doing that to anyone City Liverpool but the fact is is that way they set about us in the first half yes it was awful from the way that we applied ourselves but it's also you know let's pay a bit of respect to how West Ham are playing. You know, Jesse Lingard, absolute revelation for West Ham. Mm. And and he's scoring against everyone. Antonio, if he stays fit, they're going to rough out, rough house a lot of teams. And they've got a very, very solid defence bar in the last 45 minutes against Arsenal the other day. But still, you know, obviously we could say the same at the other end. So I don't think that West Ham are necessarily going to fall into old ways. And, and, and there are so many variables, obviously. And I know we're just... Mm projecting these things it may change when the fans go back into the stadium you know Arsenal also have a big upturn in form when the sun starts shining it's just undoubted it's like it's a tale as old as time you know but what one of the things that I'm also factoring in whilst my um league projections seem a little pessimistic to some it's also based on I am I am being optimistic in the Europa League and I expect us to get to the final and I'd be very yeah. disappointed if we don't and for that matter, if we do get to the final, I don't, as I've said to you, I don't care. I don't care if we finish ninth. I don't care if we finish 10th, 11th. It doesn't make any difference. And I think that one other final thing to say, you know, if you are someone who spots these patterns um, in terms of uh, the fo- footballing gods, you know, conspiring, it's interesting when you look at our last two games again, you know, at the uh, end of the running. And what, what did we talk about? Earlier, with regards to Unai oh, Emery's and Brighton, wow! <laughs> you know, <laughs> I didn't about even Palace. Think about that. Yeah, Palace wow, and Brighton, and at the end of the day, that's going to be ahead of a um a Europa League final. And mm. if we do push on, in in your mind, if we're pushing all the way up to fifth place, <laughs> and uh, decisions might have to get made between do we keep pushing on for that fifth that Tom Canton promised us, or do we focus <laughs> on the Europa League final, which surely would be the more um, direct route into where we want to be the only route into where we really want to be which is the Champions League and uh, European glory but 
you know, it would be interesting when you have to address that decision once again with a new manager. Because for me, I would fully back him, play the kids, play anyone, play the dinner lady. I don't care. But you have to win the cup. And that's what really matters. Yeah. Um, that That's going to bring us to the end of the show. Um, so thank you so much, people, for tuning in to our running uh, LTA show. And yeah, very, very different results, it's fair to say, but it's good. We've got diversity. We've got It's not an echo chamber anymore, uh, which is really, really good. So I appreciate you listening to the chat. If you've enjoyed the show, please drop a like on the video and subscribe. And also give Johnny a follow on Twitter. Tell people they can find you, mate. Yeah, um, well, the uh, thing, my socials are there. I'm always at I, Johnny Cochran. Who to be on YouTube as well. I'm putting out different Arsenal content discussions about what we're seeing, similar to what we're doing here. So do uh, jump over to my channel. If you can, subscribe and check my videos out. I really will appreciate it. And join the discussion of mine, even if it's just, Johnny, you're wrong. You're welcome to do that. Also, <laughs> I've got a um, podcast which isn't um, football-related. It's uh, around fatherhood. Uh, it's called the How's Your Father podcast, and I do hammer it home. But please, if you could give that a little listen, it's entertainment at the end of the day, but it's around fatherhood. If your dad's out there, or even have a dad, most people do. So check it out, listen to it. It's a bunch of funny and interesting guests on there, and it's available wherever you get your podcast, the How's Your Father podcast. There you go. And you can follow us at the Goon Talk TV and myself at Tom Canton Media. There's an article up on TGT at the moment from 101 Great Goals about um, Guido Rodriguez from Real Betis, who's another midfielder we've been linked to uh, for this summer. Really interesting Argentinian midfielder that could be joining the Arsenal uh, as a alternative to the likes of Vives Basuma. So you want to get clued up on him. There is a pinned tweet on the account. Go and have a look at. We will see you tomorrow uh, looking ahead to what is going to be a weird international break. Uh, uh, without any Arsenal football, but lots of our players are in action. So we're going to take a look at some of that stuff, I imagine. Uh, and I should be joining, hopefully, a few people over the weekend. We've got a quiz going on. Some really interesting and funny rounds have already been made with the likes of Mike and Andy and Owen. So that's going to be fun. Um, but we'll see you again very, very soon. And as always, up the Arsenal. Yeah.